You ever think about quitting? It's the combat of life, hammering the snot out of you. Well, stand by, dig in deep, and get ready to get fired up with us. Welcome to the Team Never Quit Podcast, the number one podcast that inspires you to fight on. I'm your host, David Rutt Rutherford, here with Mr. Never Quit himself, Marcus Luttrell. Our mission is to help you embrace the suck of life, to teach you the values of working your ass off, and to interview the most hard-charging people on planet Earth. We know life is hard. It's time for you to suck it up, buttercup, and let us teach you to persevere in every environment imaginable by sharing real-world lessons learned by those who never quit. That's right. It's time, Marcus, for us to help them defeat the well, negative you're insurgency me up, man. in their you're lives. Fire me up. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's roll. Let's roll. Let's roll. Two thousand one hundred and three, Marcus. Two thousand one hundred and three. That's how long our guest spent in captivity. Five and three quarter years. Five and three quarter years. Mm. I can't even wrap my mind around like two days, dude. I know you got a handle on that, but I I can't even begin. To imagine what that must have been like. And what everything that when I went back and started doing the research on this cat, right? When we started looking up uh, about what the Hilton was about, about Vietnam incarceration, man, that place was, I yeah. mean. Yeah, and we're not talking about five and three quarters years of, you know, incarceration in the United States prison. Where this you get three a prisoner, three hots a day, yeah. you get to watch Oprah. This is the Hanoi Hilton, where you're being tortured. We're going to get into the yeah, before, the details of this. Let's slow down. I, I let me just welcome our listeners before you get into reading that what you're going to read about the Hilton, man. If you, <laughs> if you are listening, a first time listener to the Team Never Quit podcast, first off, I'm I'm one of your hosts, Dave Rutt Rutherford. We're here with the wizard and Mr. Never Quit himself, Marcus Luttrell. Marcus. And what we want to do is welcome you to our show, to really to our community, right, Marcus? Absolutely. I mean, that's what we're building here. To the we're, team. We're, we're building the team, a team of resilient, gritty, never quit people that are going to support one another when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That was in stripes, wasn't it? Remember that? That was good. Is that when he goes, keep going? He yeah. runs out of the deal. No one follows him. Oh, no, it's I thought oh, it was Animal House. <laughs> yeah. Animal House. That is Animal House. Yeah. I think he says it somewhere in stripes, too, but that just might be my TBI talking. All right. So <laughs> what I want to say is, man, this show is going to set you up for a base of knowledge that is going to blow you away. I can't even begin to tell you. I mean, we, we, you think about in our lives how often we feel trapped. We feel trapped in uh, our professions. We feel trapped uh, in relationships. We feel trapped in our own minds through doubt and fear, uh, almost incarcerated by, by what the obstacles and the adversity that's in front of you. Well, we're bringing a guy on who has a, a whole mentality, a philosophy of living in 2,103 days, couldn't crush his spirit, man. And so if you're a first-time listener, stand by for that. If you're coming back and you're regular, thank you so much. We are so blessed with your dedication to us. We are so blessed with your loyalty and commitment to us and helping us spread the Team Never Quit podcast word because that's what we truly need, man. That's what we are all about is, is through word of mouth, you going out and finding somebody that you know that is in prison, right? that is locked down and can't figure out the right key to unlock themselves from whether it's a self-imposed imprisonment or it's it's the external world that's around them, man, send them to our show. Please let us help them because that is our mission in life right now. When, when the wizard and Marcus and I sit around and we talk about who we want to bring on this show, man, we're out there combing every demographic, every group, every, 
every industry, every, every walk of life to try and bring somebody that you can connect with or somebody that you know that they can connect with too. And that's what our mission is. If you want to know more about us, go ahead and check out our website at tnqpodcast.com. You can follow us on all the social media platforms out there. And I'm telling you, it's really just a powerful thing. And, and, and quite frankly, we, we got a, you know, just, I want to put this out there, Marcus, you got a big one coming up here. You guys are going back out on a Patriot tour here soon, aren't you? October. Yep. October. You're doing a show in New York, right? Philly in New York. We finally made it. Hmm. Man. Broadway. Do you, is it really going on Broadway? Yeah. That is so cool. Well, I'm not, you know, one night, but still, they said, yeah. I, I tell you, know, you Jay-Z what. Jay-Z says, man, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Oh, amen. I think it's going to be <laughs> one of the best shows, the best couple shows you guys have all done. So if you're in New York on October 19th, man, go find the Patriot Tour. You won't want to miss this night of patriotism. We've got Marcus on there. We've got Taya Kyle. We've got Chad Fleming, the one-legged badass Army Ranger. I love Chad, man. And who do we have? Who else, brother? Goggins. 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 Oh, yeah, it's kind of one of those deals where... I, the, the personal enjoyment I get and the reason I do it, man, I love seeing Goggins and Taya and Chad and all them, how their lives are just taken off and grown. I mean, Taya, Amen. it's not because of Patriot Tour, but being on the road with them and then watching them from us starting down there to how and what they are now is, is man, I love that. It's great. And it's kind of one of those deals where we never could get into New York or into Philly. Uh, and uh, we just kept... Yeah, pounding away. You yeah, never quit. Yeah, into that wall. You never quit. Yeah, you got to prove yourself to get into those places. Amen. I, and, Amen. Uh, I, when I found out we were going to New York, boy, I'm excited. And I'm pulling out all the stuff. It might get weird that night, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all coming together on that one. I love it. Now, if you're interested and you want to go see these shows, go to patriottour.com and you can buy them. Buy tickets for your whole family. I mean, this is a family event. Get out there, go at night. You are going to be overwhelmed by, by these by these people. They are so dynamic and their stories are so amazing. So please get out there and go support them. All right, Captain Charles Plum, five and three quarter years. I, I think what we need to do, dude. What we need to do is we need to have the wizard talk a little bit about explain to our audience. Just how horrific the Hanoi Hilton was. So, Wizard, Wizard, could you? Yeah, where he spent two thousand one hundred yeah, days. Yeah, right. His home. Yeah, uh, let's let's read this to kind of paint a picture for everybody that's listening out there. Thank you to Christopher Mays, as well as some various other accounts from places that were pulled together to to make this. What is the Hanoi Hilton? The Ho Lo Prison, nicknamed the Hanoi Hilton by American POWs during the. Vietnam War began as a French colonial prison. It was built over five, a period of 15 years from 1886 to 1901. Then in, in 1913, it was renovated to hold 600 prisoners, and that crowded to 2,000 by 1954. The prison and its poor conditions were a focal point of hatred and resentment by the of French rule among the Vietnamese. Locals dubbed it Ho Lo, translated as Fiery Furnace or Hell's Hole. Uh, that's a nice name, isn't it? Hell's Hole. Yeah, so who, who was in the Hanoi Hilton? During the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese repurposed the prison to hold POWs, and the North Vietnamese government used extreme methods of torture on Americans to extract information. They justified torture by claiming that the Americans were political prisoners, not prisoners of war, and therefore not beholden to the same rules. Much of this torture occurred in the infamous Blue Room. Among those housed and tortured at the prison, uh, notable names, Senator, Senator John McCain, Admiral and Medal of Honor recipient James Stockdale and Brigadier General Robinson Reisner. Reaching up to 110 degrees each day, the combined stench of human waste and sweat made it nearly impossible to breathe. The torture was constant. The Americans were thrown in tiny cells, slabs of concrete for beds, single bare light bulbs, making, it, making sleep impossible. They were in a constant state of starvation. POWs at the Hanoi Hilton regularly had their legs strapped in irons or, or stocks, the bindings were usually extremely tight to cut into the legs, causing lacerations and infections. On top of that, soldiers were faced with the grim reality that when, they had, when it came time to relieve themselves, 
being strapped to a bed face up for days on end, they had to do it as they lay there and marinated it as rats and roaches crawled all over them. Jesus. Yeah. In the words of Congressman from Texas uh, at the time, Colonel Sam Johnson, as a POW in the Hanoi Hilton, I could recall nothing from military survival training that explained the use of a meat hook suspended from the ceiling. It would hang above you in the torture room like a sadistic tease. You couldn't drag your gaze away from it. During a routine torture section with the hook, the Vietnamese tied the prisoner's hands and feet, then bound his hands to his ankles, sometimes behind his neck, sometimes in front. The ropes were tightened to the point that, they, that you could not breathe. Then bowed and bent in half, the prisoner was hoisted up onto the hook to be hung by ropes. Guards would return at intervals to tighten them until all feeling was gone. The prisoner's limbs turned purple and swelled to twice their normal size. This would go on for hours, sometimes even days on end. Aside from leg irons and, and stocks, both of which were used on me for months and years on end, the meat hook was the favorite instrument of torture within the Hanoi Hilton. You imagine that? No, I, I just, I mean, you know, you what know, drives, I, what drives, and, and what, what, what's crazy to me, and, and I don't mean to jump here on you, but, man, you think about, <laughs> you think about what human beings are actually capable of. The horrific nature mm. of with people pe with which people can can incarcerate and demoralize and and just butcher people for the mm. sake of doing it right and it really lets you know just how we operate not only as in with our prisoners of war but the moral integrity that we have and I think that just makes me feel better as an American man absolutely. You're completely right. The sadism is, is truly incredible. Um, let me keep going here. Some other forms of torture. They used ratchet-based police handcuffs, dubbed as the hell cuffs. These were tightened to the point that they dug into the skin, cutting off circulation such as the, such as the victim's hands would turn black and nerves were compressed, causing damage. Or POWs in turn there were hardly ever fed, as the Vietnamese used starvation as a form of torture. When they were fed, prisoners were given watery soup with human feces and or rocks. Many POWs were forced into uncomfortable positions on stools, then bound in place with ropes or handcuffs and left for long periods. This could go on for days, during which prisoners had to wallow in their own urine and feces. They could not sleep or rest. If they fell over, guards would put them upright again. Lieutenant Ron Storrs had been made to stand, for example, on a stool for seven days straight, beaten nearly to death by a bamboo stick, continuously. Uh, a guard named Mouse liked to throw buckets of w ice water on prisoners during winter nights when they were bound to the stool in irons or forced to kneel. One soldier held out on the stool torture for 33 days. Another example, while being transported to Hanoi after being shot down, Captain Jim Mulligan's captors poured gasoline over his bound arms, fusing the threads of rope into his wounds. Captain wow. Plum, who we're going to talk to here shortly, vividly described the conditions of his captivity at the notorious Hanoi Hilton as, I had a two-gallon bucket that served as a toilet. The tin roof turned my cell into an oven. There was the taste of salt from tears, blood, and sweat that never ceased. I had boils which covered my body and caused my eyes to swell nearly shut. A rag tied around my waist was my only clothing. And I routinely faced starvation and torture at the hands of the enemy. Now, numbers as far as uh, prisoners of war, we looked into this, it's, it's, it can be a little complicated. There's some that, uh, documenting exactly how many were taken, how many were lost. There's, you know, there's missing in action as well as POW. So the numbers here, are, uh, I don't know how confident we can be about these numbers, but it gives an idea. We we'll checked this against various sources, but um, somewhere around 1,000 Americans were taken as confirmed prisoners of war. Of them, 115 died in captivity. Um, the actual number is likely higher because many of the denizens of the Hanoi Hilton and other v North Vietnamese prisons died and are considered missing in action. Wow. I tell you what, man. I, I just, I, I think anybody that can survive through that kind of insanity and not, and, and be square, I can't wait to hear that, right? Yeah. How the hell did they get through that and maintain being squared away people because you look at the success rates of those cats post post life incarceration there's some pretty exceptional human beings man oh yeah yeah there's a long list of 
Got, really he came out accomplished. The other end of that human. And, I mean, incredible. Stockdale, after you know, he became an admiral, Medal of Honor recipient. He was even a vice presidential ca candidate with uh, Perot back right, in. Right. Yeah, That's man. Right, so, dude, I, I just man, I cannot wait. To hear what this guy has to say. What do you think, Marcus? Me either. I mean, that's that's heavy. I mean, just from <clears throat> I know how bad five days suck. <laughs> <laughs> that just keeps rolling in my head. You know, I mean, how bad five days suck. Wow. Five years, right? Five years. Five years. So rolling in my head times five years. I don't know if we, you know. In my opinion, I don't think it's something that, unless you go through it, you can't put it into words. What words can you... No, no. We, we sit here and witty banner and chin wing back and forth all damn day and yeah. try and rationalize what in the hell he went through, man. But the mindset is is something, and it's an, it's an isolated prison, man. And you can't get there unless you've been there, period. That's for sure. Period. You know what we can say, though, is that a POW, particularly in this case, that story is so uh, the epitome of never quit... Uh, I think the way that the reason right. why those guys don't have PTSD is uh, you hear about them guys that been through this the ringers, right? It's, it's one of them deals where they were in it so long that anything other than what's going on in the now, in, in the now, man, is you know it's just kind of. I know oh, what yeah. stressful is, right? Yeah. I'm not there at all, and that's got to be such a relief that you just like everything <laughs> is jovial. <laughs> that's awesome. That's kind of way I, you know, I'm mean, like, man, I know where the hell I'm not. Everything's good. That kind of deal. Well, let's yeah. let's hear from the source, man. What do you say? Let's get Captain Plum on here Definitely. so we can hear from Mr. Never Quit himself, man. Captain Charlie Plum. What do you say, Jen? I can't wait. Absolutely. Marcus, what is the most important thing that we have in America? What is the most important thing that when you wake up in the day and you take that breath of air, you check out your opposable thumbs, you stand upright, and you go live the American dream, what is the component of that that just feels so good? It's that blanket we wrap around. It's that cape that we fly and do awesome stuff with. What is it, brother? Our women. <laughs> That's not so much answer. for all the flag? of us. Not so much for all. I had to throw that out there. You know I had to go there, bro. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Set, not so much up, for I all. Had to walk into that one. <laughs> the freedoms and protections afforded by the Constitution and Declaration of Independence. Wizard, why are you so smart? The freedom of the Constitution. The freedom. You guys set me up on that one. Y'all planned that out before we walked, came in the door. Negative. That was you so good. Absolutely. Women gotcha. was my answer as well. Don't worry. So, <laughs> what better person? Seriously. What better man to, who understands how valuable that concept is, understands the depth, understands the blessings, understands the gratitude for it, understands just the, the, the presence that it is in our lives than Captain Charlie Plum. And so without further ado, man, sir, it is an honor to welcome you to the team never quit podcast thank you for being here really a great privilege to be with you guys uh, i'm honored awesome absolutely awesome well sir i you know i i have about fifteen thousand questions that are you know just raking at my prefrontal cortex to throw at you but before we get into that before we get into the meat and potatoes of this show what we gotta do is we gotta warm up we got to limber up a little bit, got to do a little stretching. You know, Marcus has so much metal in his body. So we're going to warm up with something we call the Mad Minute to, to develop oh, that. Oh, I know the Mad Minute. That's going to be my first rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get along famously. They won't ever let me go down right off the bat. <laughs> all right, guys, all right. Uh, you know, you guys ask all these millennial questions, and I, I can I can see that lava lamp on your desk. I know that you know a little bit about my uh, my story, my history. Well, well, sir, you know when I was doing my research in your opening video to your speech, you start out with the Doors. I, I'm a huge Jim Morrison fan. In fact, I'm <laughs> you trying like the Doors. Yeah, I, 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 you know, so I figured I that old. <laughs> I, I love the Doors. I thought I was Jim Morrison yeah, in I'm college. Yeah, I'm a Doors fan as well. <laughs> So what I figured is we'd have this lava lamp going back for when you were a hippie when you got me. back, no, right? <laughs> you know what? 
In my day, though, they were black and white. The lava you lamps? Got, you, yeah, everything was black and white in my day. You got a colored lava lamp. What's, what's with that? Well, <laughs> improves yeah, the trip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Thing, <laughs> things on drugs. Uh, well, you it's know, it is on air light. It is our on air light. I love it. All right. So let's get going. Marcus, are you ready? All right. Fire away, Adam. All right. So, first car. First car was a Rambler American 220. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. It. <laughs> yeah. It, it was the cheapest thing I could find. <laughs> nice. All right. Pleasure. I got another vehicle question, slightly different, though. I want you to All give right. us one aircraft or one aircraft that you never have but would love to fly and one that you would have nothing to do with. <laughs> okay, an aircraft uh, oh, I would love worst. to fly would be a P-51 Mustang from World War II. Awesome. Uh, the, yeah. Yeah, the great airplane. Uh, an airplane which I uh, don't would not like to fly would probably be uh, the Spruce Goose. <laughs> you know, the, oh, Howard nice Hughes! Yeah. Spruce Goose! Yeah. 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 I love it! Texas boy, what's up? You know, Howard, Howard Hughes got that thing about 16, off, 16 feet off of uh, off the water and set it right back down. I think he was afraid to fly it too. Right, right by Catalina, right? Yeah, it was, yeah. It was the famous yeah, yeah. historic flight, yeah. right? Wasn't that thing where each wing was a, a football that field? Where was that was Catalina. Yeah, it was right in, right off uh, Long Beach Harbor, where his uh, factory was. Awesome. awesome. All right, that these, boy, you're on a roll, sir. I dig it. I dig it. Okay, I'm, it, st I'm still scared. <laughs> if, if you were stranded <laughs> on a desert island, I know that probably gives you chills. But if you were stranded on a desert island. And you had one DVD or one CD to choose from uh, from a particular band. What band would it be, and what album? The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, or Led Zeppelin? Uh, Beatles. Okay. And um, um, I don't know. Is, is that one? The picture on the album is him walking across the street. Abbey yeah. Road. Abbey Road. Abbey yeah, Road. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Awesome. I I love this guy. <laughs> uh, favorite superhero. Uh, now I know you guys have all these superheroes with their, you know, their, their capes and, uh, climbing spider webs and stuff. My superhero is MacGyver. <laughs> that is no, my favorite I, answer. I, I, you know, I think ever. a roll of duct tape and, uh, some bailing wire. <laughs> chewing gum. The chewing gum with the foil. Yeah. Chewing, always. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's it. <laughs> that guy had a great haircut too. Dude, yeah. he had the party in the back going, oh, yeah. and that fluffy Business jacket. Business in the front, oh. party in the back. Hey, they have those on the <laughs> iTunes. You can watch the, all the episodes. Airwolf. I thought I've been down on my <laughs> You've been in there, Rabbit. Been down you got caught, have, have you? Yeah. <laughs> MacGyver freak, too. All right, Wizard, oh. shoot. I got to admit, MacGyver was one of my heroes. Um, if you could give truth serum to any one person for 10 minutes, who oh, would you give this to? <laughs> <laughs> who would you give I, it to and why? I hate to I hate to give get political this, but I'd love to know what's in the head of Hillary Clinton. Amen, amen. <laughs> fascinating, wouldn't it be? From yeah, a, yeah, it would be. From yeah. a psychological perspective, fascinating. Mm -hmm. We actually, but when the election was going on, we had Donald Trump Jr. on, and I actually reached out to try and get Chelsea Clinton on. We had yep, some friends yep. of my family are big donors, and and we tried to get up. We uh, obviously we didn't get a response, but <laughs> we made the effort. <laughs> okay, no. if you could, if you could travel back in history and have a day with someone in history, just a full day, you and them hanging out, who would that be? Well, Jesus Christ would be my first thought. You know, Holy I'd, I'd, cow. I'd, you know, it'd be neat to get to know that guy for a day. I, I'd right? say so. Right? I'd say so. <laughs> Definitely that's the leading answer so far for that question. Yes, it is. <laughs> Hands down. I Thank thought. you. Thank you. Nope. Marcus, shoot him. Could that answer just totally blowed my question down. I was going to ask, all right, the new Death Wish is coming out. <laughs> Char Charles Bronson or Bruce Willis? <laughs> who, who's, who's, who's the best man for that job? But now we got to totally ruin that. I can't. I can't follow Jesus with with a death wish. <laughs> <death twist. laughs> you know what I mean? Not to follow Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> don't follow the Jesus, man. Uh, all right, a uh, uh, movie character you'd like to play out in real life? A uh, movie character? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Boy, I had to give that some thought. Um, Tom Cruise, I guess, uh, in uh, Top Gun. 
Nice. That was so cool. Sir, but right? that's sir, never, you, correct? Sir, you did that. That yeah. was you. Yeah, yeah. yeah Actually, yeah, that, he was playing you. And I'm a. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I totally want to play. Yeah, I tell you what, I, when we get Tom on the show, I'm gonna let him know that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, as a man who would know, when Tom rides uh, rides the bike down the flight line, any possibility that would have ever happened? No. <laughs> yeah, that's what we figured. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's been a burning. Yeah, we had to ask. ask. We, didn't, we didn't have any instructors like Kelly McGillis either. I tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Question. Yeah. If you could time travel, would you rather go into the future or go back in history? I'd go back in history. Why? Uh, the f- future is too scary. I-, I don't think I really want to know what's going to mm, happen. I like that. <laughs> mm. All right, I got one. If you could be president for one day, what would you try and do in that day? And you had bit broad sweeping authority, too. So... Uh, term limits would be my first priority. Oh, God Get those bless suckers you. out of there. God bless you for saying that, sir. Everybody talks about that. How come that's not a thing yet? Well, because You're not going to vote yourself who... out of a job. Yeah. Right? Not supposed to well, be a unless job. unless you have integrity. It's supposed to be service. <laughs> well, it's not the deed. It's the glory, right? Well, wait a minute. Moving I got on. that backward. <laughs> all right. All right. Great all right. answer. Sir. So moving on. Outstanding. Well, that's the end of our Mad Minute. We really appreciate it. Your answers were incredible and awesome. But now we got to get into really the, the, the meat of, of what this show is about. And, sir, we, we, we did this because we felt we had to continue our mission of servitude in life. And the best thing that we believe that we could share with people out there is this never-quit mindset that we've been so blessed to receive from our time in the teams, from our time and our amazing experiences in life and our faith. So... People come here to find those stories, to really give them something that will stoke the fire in their gut and get them in the game, so to speak, to give them the tools to endure the combat of life and to really move forward. So please, sir, without further ado, would you please share your greatest never quit story or stories? Let me tell you my first never quit uh, story. I, I learned never quit from my grandmother. Uh, Lenora Plum was her name. She buried two husbands and raised nine children total oh my. on 120 yeah. acres in the Ozarks. Um, I don't know how they measure those 120 acres oh. because it was all like 45 degree hills. <laughs> and so I don't know if that, that, if that was from above <laughs> or from the side. But she had uh, 120 uh, acres of rock. Uh, I was living in Kansas, Liberty Town of 325 souls and a couple of Presbyterians. You guys didn't get that joke? No, no, we got it. Yeah. We got, we got it. <laughs> so, uh, but I got to spend the, the uh, I, I got to spend the summers with my grandmother down in the Ozarks, okay? And that's where I became a Republican, <clears throat> and, uh, down there in the Ozarks. She was a big, big lady. I mean, huge lady. In fact, my, my uh, I was six years old. My, my cousins were a little smaller than I was, and she'd hug them, and, and, and they would just, like, disappear in her wrinkles. She was... <laughs> Those are the best grandmothers. <laughs> so, um, but my job on on her farm was to gather uh, firewood. Now, this was before electricity or plumbing uh, or air conditioning or anything else. You know, she had. I mean, this is really basic, basic dirt dirt farming in the Ozarks. Every morning, my grandmother would make these uh, uh, these biscuits. You know, sourdough biscuits every day. And my job was to to collect the firewood to stoke this stove because there was no you know no gas or electricity it was a it was a wood stove, and and I had to do this early in the morning. It was like 5 a.m. in the morning. Well, uh, the, the beds were uh, fe- fe- feather beds, you know, uh, plucked from the down of the of the, the geese, you know, that wow. she raised. And so, man, it was really nice and warm. And I slept in one morning, and and she couldn't uh, cook her her, her uh, biscuits because I didn't bring in the wood and I see this big lady you know, in the door and she comes in and, and that's, that, that, that's how I became a Republican because she took me and she put me over her knee with a peach switch and bared my little bottom and she hammered on me and she said, you little Democrat, you. <laughs> now, now, I didn't know what a Democrat was. 
But I sure knew I didn't want to be one. <laughs> well, that's one way to do it. And yeah, and you know, from that day forward, I, I never quit. I, ne I never quit bringing in I would. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. I mean, that's, that's awesome, man. And getting I, a switch, getting a beat down, put them in the right mind frame. Yeah. Was, so as is that your only one you got another one for us no no i know well I, I teach my you know I, I teach my kids never quit as well my uh, my first son joe was uh training wheels on his bike and i would i was i was in a marathon at the time and and so i would jog along with his training wheels finally because and you know when he'd fall over you know my my mantra was plums never quit plums <laughs> never quit i love and it anytime he you know he'd Maybe he'd fall down and, and skin his uh, elbows. Plums never quit. So <clears throat> I'm jogging along, and we finally took his training wheels off, and he could ride on his own. And I'm still jogging, hanging on in there. Well, th this uh, jogging path went right along a cliff, um, and it was kind of dangerous, you know. So I had to be with him as as he was riding along. And so <clears throat> he's about to turn the corner. But by now, he can bike faster than I can <laughs> run. And I know he's about to turn the corner oh. towards this cliff. Oh. And I, Joe, Joe, slow down. And he turns around. He's like four years old. Dad, dad, plums never quit. <laughs> <laughs> Unforeseen. When your lesson. lessons go deeper than you could imagine. <laughs> yeah, they can keep coming back at you too, you know. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love it's amazing. it. I love it. Marcus, you, I, you talk I, about that all the time with your old man growing uh, up. What? Well, same kind of grandmother, grandmothers. They were the ones who led the charge on everything and raised raised the men. And then oh, yeah. whenever we got out of line, the grandfathers and the father would come in, and pound you back into the into shape, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would. Absolutely, man. I love it. I love it. So, all right, as you growing up and you've got the never quit mentality, and obviously faith is a huge component. Where did the concept of servitude to your country come into play, sir? I'd love to tell you guys, you know, that I always wanted to serve my country and be in the military and be a Marine or something like that. But the reason I joined the military is because I needed an education. And mm -hmm. so at age 17, uh, graduated from high school, um, I, you know, I sent, I sent my resume to everybody uh, trying to get scholarships. My parents couldn't afford to send me to school. And so I had to have a scholarship and work my way. And, and, and I, was, I was, you know, I... I'd been throwing newspapers and gr mowing grass and shoveling uh, mm -hmm. barn mm -hmm. stalls, you know, all, all my early life. But I, so I knew how to work. But, uh, but I wanted uh, to get an education. Well, I got an appointment to Annapolis and uh, uh, surprised everybody. I had no idea what they did at Annapolis. I really didn't. <laughs> I, I, I'd never planned on this. I, you know, I didn't know what it was. And so I got on that Greyhound bus in Kansas City, Kansas, and two days later, I was, uh, I was at Bancroft Hall. And that's the way it all began. Wow. No, huh. no, you had no, I mean, obviously from your generation and, and there were certainly men around you that had been in service in World War II, there were people around you. So there was a, a heightened sense of patriotism. Did you understand the magnitude of, of war and warfare and the implications of it at all? Not really. Yeah, most of my uh, uncles and two of my aunts, you, you know, these nine kids that my grandmother had, were all in World War II. They were all military. And so I, I knew of them, but I, uh, I was really too young to understand. I was born in 1942, and so the war was over when I was three years old. So uh, I, hmm. I didn't really know them while they were in service, but just heard the stories when they came back. So, uh, you, but, but seriously, um, I, you know, I was a Boy Scout and uh, I was patriotic and, you know, wave the flag and play in the band and, and all this stuff. But as far as, uh, you know, thinking of myself as a warfighter, uh, I, I, that didn't come along until I, until I joined the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> One of the things one of the things we talk quite a bit about as are the reference points we're able to take with us further down the road. So what we experience going through Hell Week, we're able to apply in difficult situations in combat. And Marcus tells that length about it when he talks about his experiences. 
And when you're a plebe going through in that freshman year, I'm I'm certain. Did you have any concept that those those lessons you were learning as as a person at an, in Annapolis that they would play any massive role like they did later on? I mean, were they able to instill that in you? I could see that you know the, the commonality. I could see the parallels. Uh, but I still didn't see myself uh, as a prisoner of war. You know, I, I mean, I, I really, uh, I, you know, I guess I always thought that I'd be on the high road of all this. And, you know, plebe was tough. Certainly wasn't as tough as buds. But, uh, but you know, they were. It was harassing, and and uh, there was a you know a lot of physical stuff back in those days that we endured. Uh, that's outlawed today. But. Um, and so I, so I grew up, you know, learning the lessons, and as as you guys know, the, the the more the more discipline you see in the military, the more devoted you get to the mission. Right. And so, and so I, I I sort of, as I went through the four years that the Naval Academy, and I think especially the plebe year, um, I gained, you know, first of all, a lot of respect for the service and a lot of dedication to uh, being a warrior. Wow. But I still had no idea. You know, I still had no idea what it was going to be like. I had, that's a real thing what he's talking about. Yeah. My last platoon, yeah. a, a buddy of mine, one of, he was one of our uh, officers. He, I asked him, we were out there one day, and I was like, man, how would you wind up in the Naval Academy? He's like, I had no idea, man. I just wanted to play <laughs> soccer. <laughs> <laughs> he's, I was like, he's like, you didn't want to be a SEAL? He's like, no, I didn't figure that out until I got there. All I want to do is play soccer. <laughs> I didn't even know. And, oh, this guy's yeah. great, man. And, uh, but as he's telling me this, I'm like, well, here we are and in the best place on the planet, Ramadi, Iraq. <laughs> Ramadi, <Yeah>. Iraq. <laughs> where soccer got you. <laughs> Here's your wish That's come true. That's why we don't play they soccer. They that game here. <laughs> they lovely. play soccer in the streets here. <laughs> yeah, if you would have played football, man, you know, you probably wouldn't be here. You'd be in the, sh- you know, in the league, probably. Yeah, Clint. <laughs> yeah, got right. Clint there, too. Uh, one of the things that we love to discuss here, especially for our listeners, because, you know, a lot of society right now is, is pushing towards um, – uh, almost in isolation, right? Where we come so closed off with this social media, right? Through our connectivity, we're gaining more distance from each other emotionally, cognitively, behaviorally. But it's in these training programs that you really develop core friendships. And then you have to lean on those core friendships to improve yourself dramatically. Can you describe some of that in your experience at the Naval Academy and what you started to understand about that sense of rank and structure and 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 the way you commit to one another? Absolutely, and and you're you're right. It you know that kind of training sure paid off in the prison camps, um, and. It, it was kind of amazing how guys sort of took leadership positions in the camp that you saw that they they had taken back at the Naval Academy. There were I had five classmates as prisoners of war, wow. and uh, we were class of sixty four. Class of sixty two had five people as well, and and the, the and two at the Naval Academy. Two classes ahead were the ones that that ran us the hardest. Okay, so we learned to hate these guys <laughs> because. <laughs> Hmm. You know, it was an awful lot of harassment. Um, in fact, one time in the prison camp itself, I'm out and I uh, have a chance to grab hold of a wall and, and reach over the top of this wall, uh, pull myself up to see uh, the, the guys on the other side. A guy on the other side absolutely was the devil. I mean, he was red. He had he had horns. He had uh, <laughs> flames coming out of his nose. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I fell off the wall. You know, mm-hmm. I, I fell backward off this wall. It scared me to see this devil right there. And I went back, you know, to my to my prison cell. And and uh, who what was this? It was one of the guys in the class of sixty two who had run the living bejesus out of me as a plebe, and I remembered him as the devil. And he appeared in the prison camp as the devil. <laughs> wow! Talk yeah. about your right. mind being able to. Yeah, exactly. Oh Incredible. my gosh, that's yeah, amazing. Of course. From the you know then of course in, in a different light in a different role there he became a great leader and uh, and brought us all together. <laughs> Another guy had been my flight instructor at the Naval Academy, and um, 
he had uh, he had, 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 had treated me pretty bad too as a, as a, as a flight instructor in primary flight, and um, so, and one of my first times in communicating with anybody else in the prison camp because we were all kept in solitary confinement. I've seen this window, and I know that there's a, a prisoner in, in the other side, and um, he and I hear this guy say, "Who are you?" I said, "I'm Charlie Plum." I said, "Who are you?" He said, I'm Paul Galante, your old flight instructor. And I said, well, why the hell didn't you wash me out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, my God, that's and, awesome. Uh, I guess you would have graded it a little harder, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, another did, my, you, one of my did you, sir, Mark, did you have any guys that were instructors in any of your platoons? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Man. I'll never forget this as long as I live, man. I, we had one instructor, Getka. And I love you, brother. But you did. I mean, I remember. You remember Getka, right? Oh, so, he was the devil himself. Uh, oh, okay, oh, yeah. so this Just was like I was back yeah. from eighteen Delta. I, I I think I was at the command, but I was back in San Diego, out playing golf by myself. I just kind of wandered onto the course. It was <laughs> chipping into the deal, and I hear a trail. Are you gonna get the out of my way and i i froze and i, I mean i kind of almost urinated on my you know, you know you're getting ready to go to surf anytime he talks to you man everything just goes instinctual yeah. i mean and that's what when you were talking about peeking over the wall and seeing the devil i remember out when uh when it, you know when you're kind of by yourself you draw back to your instincts right so the whatever emotion you had or developed for whatever it is in front of you like an animal right so it was the devil and then you had to relearn to i remember that and i I've gotten to know Mike real, you know, yeah. better, but I'll never forget that. I don't know if I ever told him that either, man. I just heard his voice behind me. I was like, ooh, I, I got I, cold. You know? I, I love was like, that. here we go, baby. You know, cause they, you <laughs> He's have... a great instructor, man. Oh, He's the reason I made it through training, but yep. oh, man, I'll never forget another, that. Another one of my, my instructors I ran into in a prison game was John McCain. He was my flight instructor in Meridian, right. Mississippi. Uh, he taught me to fly jets. Wow. And uh, he, he was a tough instructor, that guy. Uh, you know, the instructor sit in the back seat of these jets and I was in the front seat. He, he, he couldn't reach my head, but he had a, a knee pad, you know, a metal knee pad. And he would bang on my helmet with his knee pad. <laughs> <laughs> I would do something wrong. <laughs> would that be? Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. What are the, and I, he, Go ahead. he was shot down uh, five months after I was. And so I was the first guy to, to see him in the prison camp. Did you they get him didn't... back? Did you hit him on the head at all yeah. when he came back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never paid him back for that. <laughs> awesome. Well, let if if you don't mind, because you are creating the framework for the next kind of stage of of where I'd like to talk to about this is is you know we we have these connections to the people who pay such important roles in our development in life, right? Whether they're our instructors or we're going through class with them. And then all of a sudden, when we're in extreme environments, we need to lean on them. We need to put our faith in them, so to speak. And so, you know, could you kind of frame out as you guys moved into the position where you realized it was going to be a long haul, how those relationships were built and, and was it difficult, you know, and, and just describe how you guys connected on a, a collective and then on the inner, on the personal level. Absolutely. And, uh, it, it was critical. First of all, let me tell you a statistic you may not know. Um, of all the Vietnam veterans, 30.6% have PTSD. Of the prisoners of war, 4% of us have PTSD. Pretty amazing statistic. It's and, unbelievable. Uh, we, hmm. Yeah. We've, we've come home, uh, 591 of us came home, We've produced 17 generals and seven admirals. Most of us retired as senior grade military officers. We've got doctors and lawyers and preachers and teachers and two ambassadors from our number, two United States senators, a bunch of congressmen, vice president of candidate, a president of candidate. And so they're telling us we're doing better, healthy mentally and physically than the guys who didn't get shot down. Wow. They compare us every, every year. I have a physical and mental exam. And uh, they compare us with a control group of fighter pilots because that's most of the POWs were fighter pilots. It was an air war. We were being shot down. So this prison camp was all fighter pilots. Then what the psychiatrists and psychologists believe, and I believe too, it was exactly what you're talking about. It was the connections that we had. It was the leadership that we had. To a man, uh, everybody I've talked to anyway, 
uh, we felt guilty uh, wow. because we'd given up. You know, you, you guys have had those feelings. You Absolutely. know, the, 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 when when you don't do your best, when you didn't try as hard as you wanted, when you, you know, we you didn't make it over the bar. First of all, you feel guilty that you let your buddies down, you know, my squadron mates, and 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 then to have given up. And we all, of course, because we were prisoners of war, had given up, and we felt uh, just very demoralized and, and felt that we were victimized by these little people that had <laughs> caught us. And and, uh. and, 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 and <laughs> it was, uh, it was pretty grim. And uh, one of the, one of the first things I remember was uh, at, in the prison camps was a, a kid couldn't have been 13 to 14 year old. And he was a guard and he had a rifle, which was taller than he was. <laughs> and he brought his girlfriend in to show her how tough he was that he could beat up an American. Uh, uh, of course, I was the American. You got and, and it was for, your day. <laughs> yeah, it was my day. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, folks. Well, uh, and so, and so, you know, we we were very depressed. Some and so, some of the guys will tell you that they even considered suicide rather than have to go back and face the country that they had besmirched. You know, we, we just felt so low uh, about that. Okay. Some of my first communication said, hey, um, here's the good news. We have an organization here, a team like none you've ever played on. We have leadership here. Unbelievable. Our leaders can't see us. They can't fire us. They can't restrict our liberty. <laughs> you know, right. they, can't, <laughs> they, they, they can't promote us. They can't give us a bonus. Uh, they can't hire or fire. But, oh, by the way, this is the, the finest leaders you will ever see. Well, Jim Stockdale at the time was, wow. was, uh, was the SRO, the Senior Residing Officer. And he put out the word, hey, we are not victims. We are warriors. We are combatants. We will fight to our last breath to defeat this enemy. So put on your big boy pants, get out of your pity party, and let's get to work. And he gave us a mission, uh, a, a purpose, uh, you know, a raison d'etre. And, and it really made sense. It didn't make sense at first, you know. <laughs> Here I am. I'm a Lieutenant JG. Okay, <laughs> I'm wow. thinking the brass down in the end cell has, has come has come up all these rules for me to follow. You know, <laughs> I mean that's all I need. <laughs> Great. Is there a watch bill? I got grab the mop. Here we go. Yep. And uh, and yet, what I saw come together was in fact the finest team I've ever played on, because you know we were all responsible for the life of every other one and they were responsible for our lives and we didn't <laughs> take that lightly that's pretty serious stuff and uh and and you know there are a number of guys there that i would say saved my life and they claim that i saved theirs uh, uh and and so it was just that tight a group and it was because of that that we not just survived that experience but we thrived through the experience and and became you know came back better off than had we not even been there. Wow! I, one of the hmm. interest when you talk about this, I'm just trying to imagine because right we live in a life of highs and lows and and you know I've watched a couple of your speeches and you, you know you talk about the whole concept of having someone pack your parachute every day and and I I really. That really resonated with me, sir, even though I hate jumping, but that really <laughs> resonated with me because, you know, that's what we need. We need because nobody's perfect. Nobody can maintain a full reservoir of willpower day in and day out. We all break, right? I mean, I was good friends with a CIA interrogator for a while and and, you know, I, I remember the first time I was like, dude, you could never break me. I'm a Navy SEAL. And he was just like, <laughs> yeah. and he says, everybody <laughs> breaks, Dave, everybody. Yeah. And the concept in that breaking point is really the beautiful aspect of relationships and the love that you can have for another person where you guys, even though you, you know, Admiral Stockdale set this rigid bar of that you are still in the war. Did it require a heightened sense of emotional connectivity, a greater emotional intelligence, or was it more of, hey, pull your big pant, you pull your panties up, sweetie? Well, all, all of the above. As a matter of fact, it did certainly require a heightened sense of of, uh, of who we were and what we were there to do. 
but redefining the mission, you know, it tended to be the thing that that kept us on that track. And when I, you know, when I think of, of, of all of your never quit philosophies, you know, I think, well, sometimes when you face a big problem in life, not necessarily a military, but, you know, a civilian problem or a commercial problem or something at work, if you can redefine the mission, you know, uh, find a way to work around it rather than work through it, uh, it, you can keep on going, maybe just a step at a time, but you can keep keep on keeping on. But it, it did require that. It required a lot of com communication. And the only way we could communicate was tapping on a wall, you know, in, in, a, in a silly code that took, it took hours to get across an idea. Um, and so, hmm. and so it was, um, it, it, it was a heightened sense, you know, of, of, uh, of where we were and, uh, and what we had to do and the mission itself. Absolutely. You trained by the same body. You actually, I mean, they just took your planes away from you. You just became a ground platoon. And I, I've talked to people, and they're <laughs> yeah. talking about, man, I don't know if I'd have the patience to sit there and tap on that wall that long. I was like, well, patience go out when you got shot down. As a matter of fact, patience go out when you join the military. This is discipline we're talking about here. And it's not like I have anything else to do, right? You know what I'm talking about? I, I, this is, I can't watch. I don't have a TV in the background, you know, catching my attention. And it's all on whatever's going. And then you got the boys watching your back. If, if I'm correct, all that comes into play because we're trained for one reason, and then that's the new mission. It's like, all right, I was chosen to represent the United States of America right here, and I got to do whatever I can till the boys come get me. And I, in the back of my head, sir, I was always, it, you know, I like to tell them, like, hey, man, you, my boys didn't rescue me. They came and got me. You had something that belonged to them. I mean, I have this voice in my head that I think the military would, oh, as a collective would sound like. Right, right. Like, oh, yeah, you got one of ours. We coming. <laughs> when that storm hit and they were like oh, it's thunder and lightning i was like no nah, that's them that's my boys coming down right and it's it's one of ours you you become so tight-knit especially when you get into those situations that you can't get out of all that training just comes down into focus and uh man the level of uh love is is i, I don't know that's probably not the right word for it because no, that's a good word for it. No, it is love. You and know, that, the pack uh, mentality. It's, it's, it's just un unconditional uh, love you got for your brother, and that's why you're there. But but your point about uh, the focus when you have nothing else to think about, and it, and it really worked because especially when you're in solitary confinement and it's dark, and a lot of the, a lot of the prison camps. I was in in and out of six different camps, and some of them. Uh, had no lights at all, and they were in valleys uh, with mountains on both sides. So you had very little light. Some some of them you couldn't you 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 couldn't distinguish uh, green from red uh, in these camps. Well, hmm. when you have nothing else to do, you know they have you know uh, in our average life in in a day we have hundreds of thousands of inputs, smells and sights and sounds and and all the stuff that we're we're experiencing in a prison camp. You know they gave us nothing to do. We had nothing to read. We had no radios, TVs, telephones, nothing to do. And when your mind is in that state, you become very creative. And you can go back through your mind and, and, and recover all kinds of stuff you never thought was in there. That's cool. Uh, and, and, and even today, you know, I kind of miss that solitude. I, I'm a mountain biker, and I, I bike to the top of the hills around here. Uh, and, and, and I, I do it alone. I love it alone just because I have that quiet peace within my mind. And, and I, I think everybody should do that, you know, with prayer or, or, or with uh, yoga or whatever, uh, just to give yourself a little bit of solitude. Some great advice. You know, most of us were, mm -hmm. uh, we were all college graduates. Uh, we had, uh, masters and PhDs and guys that knew a whole lot about a lot of things. And so we taught languages. You know, French, Spanish, uh, German, Russian. Um, we taught each other, uh, um, you know, biology. And, and I, I taught a course in sailing. <laughs> I'm, a, nice. I'm a sailor. Yeah, it was really fun because, uh, you know, how, how do you teach a course in sailing in uh, a prison camp? But, but I'd take a, a piece of brick um, on, a, on a concrete floor and draw out you know, lines and winds and sets of sails and all this stuff. And about uh, about two weeks after I came home, one of my buddies called me up 
and he had rented a sailboat. This is an Air Force guy that knew nothing about the water. I'm not even sure he could swim. But uh, he, he he got in a sailboat and then just took it right off the dock. He could damn sure sail, though. <laughs> What's up? They got life jackets awesome. for that. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, and um, it, it, one of the guys had learned a lot of poetry when he was, um, yes. when he was young. And, yeah, I, and I love poetry. And so he would pass – a line at a time through the prison wall. Um, and so I know several thousand lines of poetry. We would, we would, uh, we would we, uh, memorize this, the poetry as he sent it through. One of the poems that he sent through was one called The Highwayman. And it's about this, um, you, know the, the, you, know, you know the story uh, there, Root? Uh, the, uh, let's see, wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon set up on uh, cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight, looping the purple moor, and the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The highwayman came riding up to the old inn door. So here's the Robin Hood, That's steals beautiful. from the rich, gives to the poor, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, and it was really interesting because it was like watching the old serial movies because every, every day you get another line of the story. Well, the highwayman falls in love with the landlord's daughter, okay? Bess, the landlord's daughter. The landlord's black-haired daughter. Okay, and so he falls in love with her. And so he, he promises her that he's going to go out and, uh, and, and get the gold and be back tomorrow morning. Okay, and, and so here come the redcoats. The redcoats set a trap for the highwayman by putting Bess in her window with a gun underneath her chin and they're going to threaten to kill her unless the highwayman surrenders. All right. Okay. And, and now remember, this is a line at a time, a day at a time. We're learning this story. Oh my so God. They've got her set up and it's a midnight and here comes a, uh, and here comes uh, the highwayman, you know, clop, 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 clop back into the courtyard. But Bess, all right, the landlord's daughter has, has uh, squirreled away from the ropes that were tying her down and got her finger on the trigger of the gun. So she's going to kill herself and warn him with her death, all right? Now, so we're passing this along, line at a time, line at a time. And, and I'm getting it from one side, passing on to Jerry Coffee on the other side. And so here we were. Here he comes. And, and you know, do they hear him? Clop, 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 clop in the distance. The horse's uh, hooves ring clear. Da -da 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 -da. And that night, the Vietnamese come in. They move Jerry Coffee out of his cell oh, in the middle of the no. night. Oh, no. Now, we went to GQ whenever that happened because we didn't know if they lined him up and shot him in a ditch or what, okay? So the next morning, first light, we get on our communication system. You know, we're tapping on walls and tugging on wires and wheezing and sneezing, all the ways we use to communicate. Where's Jerry? Where's Jerry? We finally got it. We found him in the far corner of the camp. They just moved him to another cell. Jerry, Jerry, are you okay? Jerry sends back, yes, but what happened to Bess? <laughs> <laughs> oh we said, my god we, we sent back kia jerry KIA. <laughs> you know there is something so profound about looking at life in, in the beauty of what the arts can give us about what yeah. education about what things to stretch our imaginations of what's possible in our lives. As you guys went through this roller coaster of, of, um, you know, you're all right, you're going to be released. You're not going to be released. You're going to be released. We're not going to be released. Did that, did that place for all of you, did it, did it ever dissipate or did you always have true faith that you were going to get out? It was never a day I thought I was going to die there. Now, I, I was one of the optimists because I thought, you know, I, I set, I, I'd always set these, um, these goals. Okay, home by Christmas, home by Christmas. When we weren't home by Christmas, it would be, you know, home by Groundhog's Day, then home by Easter, then home by the 4th of July. And, and uh, so there was all, home by Thanksgiving. And so there was always a, a short-term uh, period of time that I felt that I was going to be released. Um, and, and, it, you know, to me, that was, that was helpful. That was positive. But, um, but nobody, nobody I knew in that prison camp ever thought we were going to die there. We knew we were going to go home. We just didn't know when, you know, how long it was going to take. How could you know? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How could you know that? 
I'm trying to, as you're telling this, I'm trying to imagine myself in the same position. And I'm wondering, how could you be so certain of that? At like year four, too, right? Right, right, yeah. Yeah, well, in a way, it was sort of a survival mode. It was because I, I, my thought was, hey, I mean, if they think, if they think I'm going to die, probably going to die. If they think I'm going to live, at least I got a chance I'm going to live. And, uh, and, and, I, and I felt from the very beginning, hey, uh, I'm not going to kill myself here. You know, I, 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 that's what the enemy wants me to do. Uh, if I die here, they're going to have to exert some of their energy to make this happen. They're going to have to pull me out of here feet first. I love it. So this uh, was a I mean, this was a concerted mental effort to affect your state of mind. Is is what yes. you're saying? Yeah, you're fully. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And, and you know, I mean, I I I I realized this this my state of mind, and um, you know, I had a pretty I had a pretty good control over it. Um, I'd so say so. <laughs> to stay, you know, to stay positive uh, was was not difficult for me to do because I knew I had to do that just to survive. Would wow. You, would you have prior to this called yourself an introspective person? Or was that something yeah, developed so. as you were had so much time to think, basically? Uh, I, I I was an introspective kid, um, and so you know, I mean, I, I thought a lot about thinking. <laughs> yeah, I thought a lot. I love it. Hmm. I love uh, it. It's hard for people to to understand what the the that why would I kill myself? Because you hadn't been in it. And all the training yeah. we that we've gone through, man, I never had that feeling I had when I knew that I was there. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? Yep. And in the beginning is is the chaos, and it's funny. Yours was Christmas. I wasn't out there long enough. My, and I don't know how we figured this time. It was ten o'clock at night, right? There was a helo supposed to come in at ten o'clock at night, and after they had snatched me back, the villagers had snatched me back from the uh, the Taliban. They had stuck me in this hole, right? And I was in there kind of head first. My, I think my feet were hanging out a little bit, so I had to pull my knees in. You know, my back was broke, so I was kind of having some problems with it. Well, 10 o'clock is when that healer was supposed to come. And when 10 o'clock was getting close, I, I, I was like, hey, hey, hey. You know, they put a guard on me the <laughs> second day, which was great. And then I was like, man, that's, that's, you know, just to see somebody. That, you, you kind of, yeah, that gets yeah. to you as well. I mean, even good, bad, or indifferent is kind of like, man, I, all right, I know he's there. And then I remember pointing at my watch and it was 942 or something like that. And this helo flew over the top of our head. It wasn't there for, it was looking for me, but he didn't, uh, they didn't know that, that I was right there. And I was like, ah, oh, man, you, we got to be on time. And, was, and then t the next day I waited till 10 o'clock and, and one didn't show up. And then next day, and then I was like, all right, no more 10 o'clock. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't take I was like getting stood up on a date day after day. <laughs> totally. You know, uh, speaking of, I may live through this during the first torture session that I was in, uh, one of the happiest moments while I was being tortured was when I figured out that they weren't going to kill me, that they got me pretty close to death, and then I could see them uh, ease, ease up the ropes. And uh, it was, you know, I, I don't know if I smiled or not, but I sure felt happy when I figured out that, yeah, they know the, there's a limit here, and, and they don't want to, to, uh, to kill me. And uh, from, you know, from that point on, uh, I figured uh, that that they're not going to intentionally kill me. Uh, probably. Wow, that so. must have been so freeing for it was for you to uh, now emotionally and cognitively move into spaces where you can have mission focus. You can set little yeah. goals. You can actually uh, construct a framework of existence under extreme c captivity. Yeah, that that's very true, and it, it really did. It gave you the freedom. To uh, to put that framework together, wow! Uh, and 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 you know, and not not fear death uh, from that you know from from that point of view anyway. So that's amazing, awesome, Melanie. Before I we came on first, she wanted me to tell you specifically, sir, that if if she ever meets you in person, she's going to throw her arms around you and give a giant hug to you because she that's the way she is, right? All right, all right. But she gave me this great question to ask you because I I know how important faith was there for everybody, and and faith is a, a huge deal in our lives too. Um, what when you were in that solitude in your mind, was there a particular piece of scripture scripture that you would reference or 
you know, what did, what was, how important was that? And what did, what did you rely on? Where'd you lean on? Well, it was vital to me. And I think any, you know, anybody, when everything else is gone, when all the material things of life that you always, uh, you know, use to identify yourself, all that stuff is gone. You know, the airplane, the uniforms, all that stuff. You, you look for the things that are, are inferior, inferior and, and, and spiritual. And, uh, I, I served for two years there as chaplain. Um, so cool. That's so cool. At the Naval Academy, we had what we call the Officers Christian Union. <clears throat> and, um, and so I, I, it, it was preparing uh, officers to be uh, um, lay leaders aboard ships where chaplains weren't available. And, uh, and so, so I, you know, I took that course and got involved. So I knew a l- little bit about it, but I certainly didn't feel ordained. <laughs> but <laughs> but when I got into the prison camp. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I led a church service. Of course, we had to have it secret. You know, we'd post uh, uh, one of our guys at the door to make sure that no guard was going to catch us in prayer because, you know, they'd beat us up if they, they thought we were praying or, or singing or anything else. But uh, scripture, uh, probably, probably the, the most important scripture to me was Romans 8, 28. Uh, All things work together uh, for those who love the Lord. And, and, you know, I'm th- I, I picked that word for word. I'm thinking, wait a minute. All things work together for good, even in a prison camp, and all I have to do is love the Lord? Yeah, and, and so I, I thought, I'm, I'm going to see if this really works. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to test this one out. Because <laughs> what a great experimental place than a exactly. prison camp. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a test tube here. Oh, it's time. <laughs> I'm a Petri dish. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, I, you know, obviously it worked, uh, and, 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 and it's so easy, you know, I mean, it's simple. I mean, most of, most of faith, we try to overcomplicate, you know, we, we try to figure out reasons why this isn't going to work instead of just trusting that, that it is going to work and it works. Mm-hmm. So, that, that's but yeah, you know, tell, tell Melanie that I appreciate that question. And, um, and it really is true that, uh, uh, that faith was a, it was a very, very strong part. Uh, part of a part of the of the plan, okay, that Stockdale came up with, and uh, part of the organization was levels of resistance. And so we had various levels of resistance. Well, in my in my prison cell, we had quite a few guys in this little prison cell. We decided to go on a, a hunger strike to get a Bible. And, um, and, and we did, we passed back the hmm. pumpkin soup and passed back the rice and said, we're not going to eat and get, you know, bring us a Bible. Um, the interesting part was I had three guys in there that considered themselves to be atheists. Okay. And they didn't believe and, and, you know, I mean, they were part, they were part of the team. They were going to go along with us. Wow. Uh, but, oh, oh, by the way, uh, they, you know, they didn't, they didn't care. Um, and, and one of them was second in command. All right. Well, so the first thing when we announced to the enemy we're going to go on a hunger strike, they cut off our water. And as you guys well know, you can <laughs> you can live a long time without fish heads and rice, but water uh, about two days and you Man, start to go crazy. Thirsty. Yeah. yeah. God dang. <laughs> the second thing they did was uh, they pulled out our senior guy who was a fundamentalist Christian, you know, and was in charge of all this. Of course, now I'm, I'm the chaplain, so I, I'm involved as well. But, uh, but I'm not seeing, I'm a JG, and this guy was a commander. Uh, so they pulled him out of there. And so here's the atheist, all right? He's got to make this decision as to, hey, what's, and, and I'm watching this, and I'm happy I'm a JG. <laughs> but right. I'm, I'm watching, I'm watching what's going to happen. And uh, the atheist said, continue the strike. Continue. So we... Uh, so we, we still, uh, we continued our hunger strike and, uh, and we got thir- pretty thirsty about the second day. And then I had, I, I, I hit a nail. I'd found a nail and I hid this little nail and I started burrowing, uh, into the hole, a uh, hole in the cell wall and, uh, made a hole through that prison cell to the guys in the cell next door. And they weren't on a hunger strike. And so they pat and I put a tar paper tube in this, in this hole and talk about Mac- MacGyver, right? Mm. That's and, it. Uh, yeah. And so they poured half their ration of water into the tube, and we caught that water on the other side, and we we're going to survive. Okay? Oh, my so gosh. So they eventually came back in with a Bible, okay? And it was a tattered, torn, dog-eared old copy of the King James Version of the Bible. 
and uh, we had it for one day. We didn't know it at the time, but we had it for one day. And of course, I was the chaplain, and I was in charge of the Bible. And uh, everybody wanted to c come up and and just put their hand on the Bible, just touch the Bible. And my three wow. atheist buddies were at the front of the line. <laughs> <laughs> there are there wow. are no atheists in foxholes or prison camps. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Did so? Uh, yes, very important. Did did just on a side note, and then we'll switch directions a little bit. But did did those those guys who who didn't have faith directly in Christ or the Lord? Did they have a, a level of faith in each other, though, that was reverent? Oh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in reality, they had a deep faith in something almighty. They just didn't know how, you know, they, they, they didn't know how to verbalize it. They, they didn't know how to define it. But I think they knew that there was a master plan here. And uh, they wanted to abide by it. But certainly faith in each other. I mean, that was that was just a given from the very beginning. That's all we had was each other. Now I, I've heard another interview where you you talked and you referenced this in in your new book, "I'm No Hero," about the insanity that can ensue in in terms of captivity. And you give one particular incident. Was was that fragility of the mind something that you guys had to deal with as a collective on a regular basis? I think or it, was I think it, it I think that it really um, depended on the individual. The case that you're talking about in my book, I, I talk about a, a guy who was tortured to insanity, and um, uh, y y we we certainly tried to strengthen each other and uh, in our, our our mental state. And if we saw a guy getting really down on himself and crawl over in a corner and curl up and and uh, in the fetal position, and you know, we'd go over and and talk to him and talk him out of that and and try to bring him back to to a sense of purpose and a sense of uh, positive reality. And so, uh, yes, you know, we certainly we certainly tried to help each other out in our mental state. Um, the guys. I don't know. I, I I think the guys who had the problem there weren't very many really that had I any mental. There were a couple of guys that uh, attempted suicide. Uh, you know, they, it got that bad for them. But I feel like that they probably had those tendencies even before they got into the prison camp. Right. Because uh, it, most of us, uh, you know, really <laughs> didn't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say. Let me. Uh, I'm I'm curious a little more detail on because um, obviously this is an extreme example. These guys that you're talking about that went into these dark moments, what did you find to be most effective in? What would you say to these guys? What would you remind them of? What what technique really seemed to work well? To pull them out, right? To bring them back. Yeah, uh, talking about home and talking about mission. You know, talking talking about the purpose. Uh, you know, why we're here. And uh, you know, you got a wife and two kids back home, and they're counting on you to come home. You know, they're praying every day for you, just like we're praying every day for them. And uh, and and you know, it, this is bigger than you. Uh, taking your own life is no solution. Uh, and uh, you know, even even being depressed is, is is that that's no help at all. You know, you're you're killing yourself. And not only that, but you're feeding right into into the enemy's plan. You know, they they love it. <laughs> they love it hmm. if you killed yourself. And they, they you know they love it when you go into depression. I mean, this is part of the war is staying positive. And so you know, it was it was basically just a reminder of um, you know home and family and purpose and and each other. You know, you can't let us down uh, by being this way. You you have to. You have to pull your own weight around here. You know, you're you're a link in the chain, man, and uh, you know, we 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 can't do it without you. So that you know that was sort of the context of of how we tried to bring guys back, and it, and it worked. Hmm. One of, one of the things that I I really focus on is this greater belief that there's this ever present and perpetual negative insurgency coming at us all the time, right? Mm -hmm. You you. You had it in its most sadistic focus imaginal. Did you guys develop any techniques or tactics that really helped kind of, you know, co confront that insurgency against you, distract that insurgency, or was it more, hey, by the more pain they put on us, the stronger we get? H how did you meet that insurgency from these very malicious, sadistic guards 
head on and and also on, on a little side note was there ever any compassion or empathy from them well i'll answer your second question first there was was only one guard in my entire time there in the six years i was there there was only one guard that ever showed any compassion at all and he was a, a brand new new hire that came right out of the out of the jungle and they gave him a rifle and told him to uh you know to guard these prisoners and he would he spoke no english and we spoke no vietnamese and uh, but he would uh, he would joke around with us and and uh, uh he they had issued him a brand new pair of boots and uh, see, so you walked in with his uh, his new boots on and a deck of cards, and so he's going to play cards with us. And we decide, what well, what are we going to bet? Well, we had these rubber tired sandals, uh, you know, these sandals made from um, from from old tires, and the the tubes of the tire were the straps of the sandal. Mm. And so we just with charades, you know, uh, pointing and grunting, we decide we're going to we're going to uh, uh, we're going to bet our sandals against your new boots. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, yeah. You know, this is a little kid, you know, a little kid. We taught him to play the game of war. You know, you know, you lay one card down, and whichever's the bigger, and and all right. that stuff. And he beat us. <laughs> 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 and so he picked up our rubber tired sandals, and he walked out with them. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever's idea yeah, that was, you're like, good great job, idea. yeah, great idea, yeah, Plum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, he, he brought him back a few years, you know, a few hours later, and uh, and laughed. And then they sent him off for, for their indoctrination. And he was gone for three or four weeks, and he came back just as mean as all the other guards. Oh, wow. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was disappointing the way they could uh, train these guys to be mean. And, uh, and they did. <clears throat> Let's see. I've forgotten your first question. That, how, uh, how did you right? face the, the – Oh, yeah. Face the, the, that, face the negativity. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. We did it a lot with humor. Uh, and it, humor right. became a very important part, uh, uh, yeah, of our uh, existence, of our survival. And we would play little tricks on the uh, on the guards, and it really gave us a lot, a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, of self confidence, you know, just to think that we can get the best of these characters. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, a lot a, a lot of their negativity we would we would turn around uh, with some humorous. Uh, anecdote or or some a little trick that we would play, and some of it was just really stupid stuff. Such, but such was, as what, for example? Um, well, let's see. Um, you know, we 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 would uh, steal something from them that they didn't know. Like <laughs> like if one of them had a a pin or a bracelet or something like that that was laying around, and we could pick it up and keep it for a while. You know, it just, it was a big deal if we could keep our hand in the cookie jar. <laughs> little and, wins. Uh, and, yeah, j just Small a little victories. bit. Just, Small know, victories. My co-pilot and I were, of course, shot down, uh, and he parachuted out, and uh, I could see his parachute. I knew he was going to be all right. And then he put us uh, in uh, two different Jeeps to haul us into the prison camp, and uh, they tied a rag around my my eyes. And, uh, and, I mean, I think I was delirious because when – I heard him, I said to him, I said, this country is 100 years behind in blindfold technology. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Why I would say that, I don't know, but it's just, you know, like you say, it's one of those little quips that... Uh, they, they took, I couldn't walk, they were having to carry me everywhere, and, for my, and my legs were sliding down, I had my boots on, the only things I had left, they were tied on. And for whatever reason, they thought it was my shoes were the, was the reason I was slipping. So they pulled them off my feet, and I was like, well, "Hey, I uh, what? It was dark. God, dog." And then all of a sudden, this dude comes walking up with these the the movie Vacation, Clark Griswold, where oh, where, yeah, yeah, yeah. where he, yeah, those yeah. white shoes that he gets, and he kind of they brought those out. I was like, "Oh, look at these oh, Griswolds wow. right here. What are you gonna do with those?" And, and they were two sizes too small, I think, and they were cramming them on my feet, and my toes were all. Yeah. And as we, they were dragging me up that mountain, I was like, oh, this is good. I got great tracks now, these suckers, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where would you get those white leather kind yeah, of whatever you look shoes, good. man? Man uh, jams man and Griswolds. Man jammies on and those shoes. Man oh, yeah, jams like and Griswolds. Oh, God bless. I'll never get that. <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you so much for sharing the, you know, those details about the friendships and those connectivities and that and 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 those moments that got you from one day to the next 
what about afterward? Obviously, you know, and you, you you're it comes to an end, and then the next chapter for you begins and begins for all of you. Um, mm-hmm. Is how do you how do you look at that day forward when you got home you got off the plane all of a sudden you're free you're back in the united states one how long did it take for that to settle in and then two how did you brew build the new framework for your life good question Uh, i had planned my life out uh for the next 20 years i'd married my high school sweetheart uh, from Kansas, nice and uh, we were married under the Arch of Swords uh, the day after I graduated from the Naval Academy. Awesome. And and so I planned the next 20 years around her. And, uh, you know, at first I planned sort of a medium career, and after I wasn't home then, I thought, well, I planned it a different way. And so I had what <laughs> what I call saunt- saunter, buster, and gate. These are fighter pilot words. How are you, how you going to go to the, the target? Saunter, buster, gate. And and so, you know, I had, uh, you know, kind of meander my way through, make commander, retire after 20. That was okay. Or Buster was going to be, no, I wanted a squadron. I wanted to get into uh, to test pilot school. I wanted to be a Blue Angel. Uh, and Gate, you know, was going full bore. You know, I'll be at sea all the time. I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll command an aircraft carrier someday and maybe even a fleet. And so I had these three different ways I was going to propose to my wife when I got home. Well... <laughs> When I uh, got, yeah, got off the plane and made the phone call, she was gone. And I called my parents back in Kansas. What's happened to my wife? I'll never forget my mom's word. Bless her soul. She said, son, I'd give 10 years of my life if I didn't have to tell you this, but your wife filed for divorce just three months ago. Oh. She held on for five years, and then she just couldn't take it anymore. And so, uh, so I was left um, kind of hanging there without a plan. Um, and uh, I was at Great Lakes Naval Hospital uh, for the first two weeks uh, after I was home. And they, you know, you know during, during that experience, one of my prayers uh, during that POW experience was that the, the, pres- that, that, that the experience uh, would have some value, that, that the pain that I was feeling then would, would, le- would lead to something positive in my life. Amen. And so... But but I still hadn't figured out how that was ever going to work. Well, I was the first guy back to the Midwest, and everybody wanted to know the story. So I agreed to uh, be at a press conference in the basement of that hospital. And I was surrounded by 150 photographers and reporters, and I told my story. On the way back up to my, my hospital room, uh, as the elevator doors closed, this young reporter came in. I was face-to-face with this guy, nose-to-nose, young guy. But he had lines of anguish in his brow and tears in his eyes. And he said, Mr. Plum, you really got to me in there, man. I've, I've had a miserable year. My family's falling apart. My job is terrible. He said, I even wondered if I wanted to go on living. He said, you've given me hope. Amen. Well, you, you know, and my thought was, wait a minute. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to give you any hope. I'm just <laughs> telling a story of a Kansas farm kid that got into trouble, you know? Uh, wow. What's it, you've given me hope. And, but suddenly I, I recognized there was value in the experience itself. Uh, and so I wrote a book, as you say, my autobiography, and it's in its 30 second printing. Um, and if you don't have one, you're underprivileged. Congratulations. And, yeah. <laughs> and thank you for the book, sir, that you sent to Marcus. And oh, I yeah. really okay. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And I, and, and I autograph it, every one of those that's, uh, that's ordered from my website, and so uh, happy to do that. But, you know, it's the same thing you guys are doing, and I really, really appreciate you telling your stories. Because most veterans, most Vietnam veterans, and certainly nearly every World War II veteran I've ever run into is reluctant to tell a story. And I think it's just vital that you guys tell the stories of, of buds and the challenges you faced and and the combat that you faced, uh, uh, Marcus. Uh, uh, and so so anyway, I, I saw a purpose in life. I saw a reason um, that to hang in there and start telling stories. So I wrote the book and I said I promote that book. I made over four hundred presentations the first year I was home. Wow. And uh, and that, and, that, and that was forty. Three years ago, and I'm booked well into the middle of 2018. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good for you. Wow. God bless you. See if we can't keep that going. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. And so I'm, you know, uh, I'm still telling the story, and uh, and the key, and you guys have seen this just as I have. 
the key isn't that it's a war story. It's a story of a of a guy with a problem. And we all have problems. And whether your listeners are civilians or students or retired or or military guys, I mean, everybody, women, children, we all face these challenges in life. How do you get through these things? Well, you don't quit. <laughs> you never, never quit. <laughs> That's a great point, though. I mean, a lot of the people out there, the civilians that are having the problems, man, a lot of the answers are been solved in, in military and combat or any military situation. The stories that we, you talk about, the guys are sitting on, and it's because it's, you know how it works, and, and this is why our country is so great with the civilians, that respect thing. They don't ask or pry because they, they weren't there, and it's it's not a it's yeah. usually not a good thing. It's a bad thing. And I, I, always, yeah. I heard from a, this kid, see, how do you say He's like, you know, my, my grandfather was World War II. He never talked about it. And I was like, yeah, he did. He just didn't talk about it to you. You know, we talk yeah. about it with yeah. each other, oh, yeah. and, our, and, our, and, each other. and it yeah. stays Absolutely. inside. But every now, you know... When when the guys when we get out and we come back and we become civilians, I think some some the civilians themselves they it's not that they want to know the story just because they think it's cool, man. They want to know so they can feel that emotion with you and, and they can just kind of somehow relate to that different world that you exist in. And now you're trying to come back and exist in in the one we came from. But you're right. I think that when when what you've done, especially after what you've been through, man, it eases that tension, right? That reluctancy that to stand away from those guys who went through the bad stuff. And most of the time, guys, you know, like, hey, man, I'll tell you what yeah. you want to oh, know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll help you yeah. out. This is how I did this. It's no, no brainer. And you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a human, the human element is what connects everybody. It doesn't have to be what job Amen. description or anything like that, man. That bad, we, we, in a, we in a bad spot. You know what I'm talking about? We in a bad spot right here. <laughs> and then, you know, you get back. There's other people who are going to walk that same line that we did. And, I mean, they've kind of been coming to us to pass that knowledge down to help them out, I think. I think God taps us to do it. You know, I, 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 I totally agree. And, uh, and, and, you know, my mother was so prophetic. Uh, she wrote a letter to my wife, my ex-wife, uh, the day I was shot down. And, uh, and the letter said, um, it's so terrible that Charlie is not going to reach his full potential because now he's been shot down and, and may not survive. And, but nobody knows God's plan. You know, maybe there's a bigger plan than he will actually have more opportunity to touch lives of people because of the experience. And, and, and she hmm. said that the day I was shot down. <laughs> so Sir, not knowing if I was alive or dead. Sir, I, I got to tell you, the wizard just brought this up the other day. We were having this very same conversation about trying to gauge the weight of the impact we had while we were in service versus the impact we have now. And we just, in our, we, we did a, conduct an interview last um, evening, and at the end we usually read a reader story. And this reader story was about a man who was on the brink of suicide who found our show and now it's piecing his recovery back week to week. And so mm -hmm. it's undoubted. Mm -hmm. It's there's no doubt in my mind that the impact that you are having specifically and the story that you share mm -hmm. of your perseverance, your faith, the brotherhood that you were a part of the ability to move forward and beyond that in a healthy manner, you are saving lives and impacting lives Far greater than any plane you ever flew, sir. So I appreciate <laughs> okay. it. Well, I I, I appreciate that, uh, and I, and I hope I hope you're right. I I believe you're right. You know, I mean that's why I keep on doing. I'm 75 years old, and uh, I'm gonna keep on doing this as long as uh, the Lord uh, gives me air to breathe and, uh, and 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 a good wife to to cook. <laughs> so. well, there's no doubt about that in my mind either. As soon yeah. as you talked about the 43 years and. I, I just started thinking, my God, that's got to be an enormous number of people that he's, he's touched. Impacted. So yeah. I'm with you on that, buddy. Sir, well, thanks. I've, spoke, I've spoken about 5,000 times, well, a little over 5,000 times uh, all over the world. And, uh, and I've really, really been amazed, you know, at th th that, that the story has had legs that it's had. Because I, you know, I remember just a couple of years after Vietnam, I thought, man, this is ancient history. And the majority of my audiences today weren't even alive uh, during my story. Uh, you guys weren't. And, and so, um, 
it, but but there's a there's a thread there's a constant thread there and it's a thread of humanity Amen. it's a thread of resilience you know it's a it's a mm -hmm. it's, it's a thread of meeting challenges and finding uh, solutions so the end of the story uh, is that I've remarried uh, four wonderful children I uh, have uh, I have two airplanes uh, and a sailboat and in fact I j just came back from uh, British Virgin Islands where uh, my son commands one 48-foot boat, and I command another 48-foot boat, and we chase ourselves around Tortola. Uh, you know, life is good. Can you, bef before we sign off, can you please share with our guests where they can find you, how they can get in touch with you, where they can find your books? Can you, can you share that? Sure, sure. Appreciate that. Uh, charlieplum.com. C H A R L I E P L U M B dot com. Charlieplum dot com is my website, and I'm on Facebook and Twitter and all these things as well. Um, I answer every email that's sent to me. So Charlie at Charlieplum dot com is uh, is the way to get a hold of me, and I I'm happy to share um, and uh, you know autograph a, a book for you for you. I've got videotapes and all that stuff as well. I'm on the speaking circuit as well. And so I talk to corporations and trade associations and churches and schools and, and, uh, you know, like you guys do. And, uh, and so I, 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 I crisscross the country, um, every week. Um, a lot, a lot of airplane miles. In fact, <laughs> for my, for my birthday party, I'm, uh, cash in just a few of my airplane miles and taking uh, 25 of my relatives to Hawaii. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. Bless my your son heart. My son-in-law is a Marine Corps captain stationed at Kaneohe, Kaneohe Bay in oh, yeah. Hawaii. So, so they've invited us over there for, uh, for my 75th, uh, 75th birthday. Have you well, been out there to Kaneohe? You've been out there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought, man, I, I spent a tour out there too. Yeah, it's a pretty cool place. Man. That's awesome. Yeah. Of course... My son, my my son-in-law, you know, I mean, stationed in Hawaii, you think really great. He's been deployed to South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hawaii must be cool, right? Yeah. I don't know. My stuff was there. I guess they had a good time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my dog is there. Yeah. <laughs> he lived it up. Hopefully, he learned how to surf. Right. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Totally. Well, sir, thank you so much for coming on and and for sharing with us and our listeners. I, I there's no Absolutely. doubt in my mind that they ha can take away just uh, countless points and and just in and of itself just be enlightened by you and your experience. So we really appreciate it. I just love the fact that you are spiritual, you are, and you are doing God's work. So thank you, sir. Well, right back at you. You know, I really feel a brotherhood with you guys. I've known several SEALs and just loved every, every one of them. You guys, you guys are really, really the uh, uh, backbone of America. Appreciate you. And if, if you, either one of you run for president, I'll be your campaign manager. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, that's your brother's going to definitely run, yeah, right. dude. That's yeah, that's him. Morgan. Yeah. It'll be Morgan, not Marcus. <laughs> We're twins, so yeah. it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, sir. God Take bless care. you okay. so much. Thank you. Take yes, care. Bye-bye. Bye. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. And, and the, when you hear the story, what I couldn't just, I couldn't stop thinking the whole time, right, is that number, the number. And... <laughs> The number. You're screaming two, that downstairs. I know, man. That's 2,103 days, wizard. You know, in the interview, it was almost, he was so, you know, with his personality and the way he talked about things and just his general tone and spirit. Demeanor. It was kind of easy to Let it drift away from that, but... Even with, you know, seer training, which I guess is as close as you can get to a taste of that, you, I, I, I can't wrap your mind, I can't wrap my mind around that. Oh, you ready? Good. Are you ready? Are you ready for my seer training story? All right, seer training, Listen, right? Yep. This was back in a day, we're all going, and we, like, team one, team three, team five, we're doing takedowns on the seer school. So I had gotten the tip that, you know, my class was good. A couple of SEAL Team 1 platoons were going to do the takedown, and I was good, right? Mm -hmm. So I go into the space, and I'm, we're having fun, and, I, I, you know, there's a hilarious story about gut and camouflage in his testicles, which was a whole other thing, and I'll tell that later. But we get into this <laughs> thing, 
and you go into the camps, right? And we're having fun, soft sell, hard sell. You, they, you have to pull off to the side because, hey, you're not playing the game. Or, you're like, whatever, dude. I'm, they put you in the little thing, the box, and all of a sudden I start going, all right, any minute we're going to get out. Any minute we're going to yeah, get out. Yeah. Any minute they're going to hit it, <laughs> we're going to get out. Any minute we're going to hit out. It was not like I was in there for days. I was not in there for, uh, <laughs> you know, any long amount of hours. But, dude, I mind-blanked myself so bad. <laughs> but by the time where we had the one, like, 18-year-old seaman who who uh, who literally, like, who fell off the ship and he becomes the propaganda guy in Sierra. Did you have that, dude? Yeah. Well, I clipped out of Sierra. <laughs> I'm the reason all the new guys have to go through it. Sorry, bros. I'm so sorry. I mean, I didn't mean to do that, but the irony of that. Yeah, because I didn't go. <laughs> because I didn't go. Cannot through be it. understated. Oh, my JP8 debrief started when I was in the hospital, and then after that, it was Sear. I mean, I, me and, and the Sear guys are close. Tight. Yeah, man. I spent a lot of time with them jokers afterwards. <laughs> there is a tremendous amount of irony I, in that. There is. Yeah. So. The, the point is, is I'm reflecting on 2,103 days and I'm moaning about eight hours in, in Sear School in Southern California. I'm, I, it's unfathomable to me. No, no. Here, here, here's the deal with that, man. And this is kind of the one thing where I got, I have that perspective. Yeah. I want to know what you think of that. Yeah. So check this out. Um, you guys are like, man, I couldn't. And I, I thought this. I thought the same way, right? And even when you're going through Sears School, the problem is, is that in in a team guy's mind, you know that that the instructors are our instructors, right? Yeah. That it's going to yeah. end, right? So you get put in a box like this. Is bullshit, man! I got stuff to do, man. I got you know. Talk about <laughs> it's you know, just I gotta go. I gotta it's, go. It's, it's really fucking link by exactly. 55. But think about it like if it was like buds, like you had no idea, right? Mm -hmm. My my point is, is man, there's something that kicks in that uh, it, it, I don't think it's kind of impossible for it to happen. In, in in the school environment right you know what i'm talking about yeah now, it may happen no to those, i don't but i understand no, no, what you're saying it may happen to the kids they sent through Sears school that aren't as trained as we are but man because of our what we've already been through in that mentality you know how when we go to Sears school we take it over and then they're like oh. hey we got to do this kind of deal and yeah and uh, even Morgan, he's like, when that dude slapped me for the first time, I was like, hey, don't, don't, don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, that first yeah. open palm. That first that, open palm Oh, slap. my God, Morgan's, I wanted yeah, to punch Morgan's that guy. Morgan's playing the game, dude. And that, that dude slapped me. He's like, don't, don't do that again, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just think of some of the guys we got in our team, man. Yeah. I mean, those instructors have to be standing there going, this could probably go really bad. I mean, Imagine I'm looking at Imagine hitting Tage in the hey, side Tage of his head. Or somebody like that, dude. <laughs> All right, so when <laughs> when he's telling this story, and I'm trying to keep it in that framework, but you are exactly right. For me, it was his positivity, right? How he delivered the message of probably one of the most difficult situations any human being can be in, right? Where where they're where your captors or the people are against you, and and this could be in your life if you're growing up in a shattered home where you're being devalued on a regular basis, right? Where the value, your your uh, integrity, your what's the word I'm looking for? Your dignity is perpetually mm. being stripped away, and that's their job. That's their mission. At an extreme level, you know, to try and summon it up every single day to make it through the day to get to well, the that's, next. Well, that's that's kind of what gets burned away. I mean, all that white noise, that dignity, that pride that usually messes with us when all this stuff happens, man. Then it's just survival, instinctual. And then once that village. When I, man, once I got in there and they put their hands around me and I figured out what was going on, it was his love, bro. I mean, love. I loved how you described that, how mm. Captain Plum described it. It is that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you hear these guys that, 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 that were in the, and first of all, man, 2,000 days comes out of there and is just walking tall. I mean, hell, I was out there for five days. How am I not going to walk tall? Right. I mean, he was I, talking about what his purpose is. His purpose is for, to show me what in the hell a warrior looks like. Exactly. And then my purpose was to, I, and you, know, you don't think about this when you're in. You're like, I could, you know, just take it, man. You know, this is stupid. Why am I doing this kind of, and then you just keep pushing and you, and you don't think about like, well, you know, one day this kid's going to look up and <laughs> Marcus went through Afghanistan and he got out of the hospital and went back to Iraq. You know, when I was doing that, that's all I thought about. Right. I had to have you all around me. Yeah. I didn't know any, mm -hmm. man, to separate me would have been bad. 
horrible. And you think that's a huge component. Like he talked about it. The guys, you know, I wonder if he Vietnam, missed those guys when they, you know, what I'm talking about when they pulled him out of there. Oh, he had. To, oh my you know god! I mean, that, like, to exist that other. long in that prison, you have to. I would assume he had to establish a new normal, sure. right? Those guys would have just been a, a an inseparable part of his new reality. And walking away from that, I wanted to ask him. We didn't have time. I was kind of curious. Was he afraid to go home? Because you hear about guys that get out of prison and they, you know, they have a problem readjusting and whatnot. They've oh, become wife. used to that. Yeah, man. I, not saying he wanted to stay and <laughs> stay there. Right. Obviously, the not. institutionalization. But I wondered what you know if he was a little concerned with. And you sort of asked him the readjustment, but. Well, look at the success ratio. Of yeah, he the started five, rattling off all the, the... five hundred and ninety-one guys. That was super interesting. I, 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 if here's that what, doesn't tell you the power of developing a never quit mindset, I'm assuming that that's why they were so successful. And and those numbers, all that stuff comes from a book called Lessons of the Hanoi Hilton. So probably what we ought to do is go find an author of that book and see if we can bring him on to help explain some of that other stuff and 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 get into it. But let let's come back to what our listeners need to take away from this. In my mind, what you have to understand is that the relationships you create and the, and the time, the small little things that you make and invest in the people around you when you're in prison, whether it's the prison of your own mind or you're in the prison of failure, whether you're in the prison of defeat, whether you're there in the prison of judgment or hatred or anger, Go to the places around you where you know that love is true. And if that love is true, it lifts you up every day. And you have to lean on the people that you love, that you know they love you. That's what I took. What did you take? I want to expand on exactly what you said. because That's one of the things that I thought was really important because when we talked with, with James Lawrence, and he talked about having the bucket of whys. Yeah bucket of reasons i mean this is basically what you're saying and i heard that immediately pinged in my brain when the captain was talking about uh what were you reminding those guys of when you're trying to bring them back from that dark that dark spot right you know bring them back it was basically he was telling them, these are your whys you know this is have that bucket of whys have that bucket of reasons those accountability points in your life to draw on when you need it yes be aware of them take the time to think about those things that they're there when you need something to lean on. I love it. Marcus, that was awesome, by the way. Yeah, I mean, if you, that was awesome. you pack those as deep, even to the stupid ones, right? It's just that one even look, one that doesn't mean anything to anybody else. It meant something to me, man. That'll keep me going. You know, that kind of deal. Right. Yeah. But listen, if you're tuning into this show, <laughs> I don't even know how to segue oh into God. that. This has been what this is I this has been one of the most fun, but one of the heaviest shows for sure. Because when you talk about freedom, you have to conceptualize or take a crack at what it means to lose your freedom. And I think a lot of our listeners come here because they feel like their freedom has been taken away in some capacity, whether it's by their own choice or by their choice of their environment or by the people around them. So if you're listening to this show and you're not feeling free in your life, at least take this away from what Captain Plum was saying. You, you can endure in the hardest things imaginable if you just have faith in something bigger, in particular the team around you, in particular you know, wearing, being a part of something that's bigger than yourself. So the first thing you need to do to... to, to be released from your own incarceration is to become a part of something bigger than yourself. And that's what I hope you're hearing. And, and if this is your first time, welcome again. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. We love you. If, if you're coming back, you're a regular listen, God bless you. We, we are so thankful for you and, you, and, and your, what you're doing for us. If, if you if you heard something in this show and you felt like you've been in captivity in some capacity, please write in and share with us how you got out. Share your never quit story about how you were released from the prison that you've been in in your life. Please write into our website. 
It's incredible. We want to. If the story is amazing, we will read it on air. If it's incredible, Marcus. I'm going to bring you on. We're going to bring you on. So I, I, I just want to end one more time, as I always do. I want to give thanks to God and Christ for my life, for taking me out of captivity. I want to give thanks to my children, to my family. You know, more importantly, I want to thank the two of you. I mean, for what you do every day with me when we put this on and how I feel and the freedom that I feel of what we're able to serve our listeners and thank our listeners. But most importantly, this one, I, I want to thank Cap Plum because mm -hmm. that man and what he's done and the sacrifices he's made and what he does for this country and for the world right now is profound. And so thank you, sir, for, for being on our show. Oh, yeah. I'm wore out, man. <laughs> I'm all sweaty over here. What's up? <laughs> I, I, man, I'm just gonna, I, Captain Plum. I tell you what, man, you, you keep doing what you're doing, and thank you for walking tall and coming back. And and like I said, you, sometimes our boys get left over there, get dropped off in hell, and get drugged down there a little while longer than they should. And when they come back, man, and they just, they just stand tall and 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 live life no matter what. That that's. That in itself is, uh, man, that's godly almost, right? It is. So thank you for that. Thank you for the lessons. I learned a lot from you today, absolutely. Uh, take care of yourself, and God bless. I'm out. I'm out.